bow our heads for a moment of prayer before we open God's word. Dear Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It was Sunday morning. The homemaker was awakened by the sound of her husband working in the kitchen and by the odor of warming food. And then he came pushing his way into the bedroom carrying a tray full of her favorite breakfast foods. She thought she died and gone to heaven. Oh, she said, it's beautiful, and the food looks and smells so delicious. The husband said, you noticed. Well, how can I help but notice? You noticed exactly what I did? I'll never forget one single thing. I noticed it all. Well, that's good, he said. Because the reason I did it was I wanted you to see how I want my breakfast every Sunday morning from now on. You see, some of our nicest deeds are nullified by nasty motives. Of what value is a good act unless it is prompted by a good attitude. Jesus taught that Christianity goes beyond acts to our attitudes. That's our lesson this morning as we continue our study of the Sermon on the Mount. I invite you to open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Matthew chapter 5. Last month, we started our series on the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes. Today, we're going to look at attitudes. Perhaps the very central theme and the most earth-shaking idea in the entire Sermon on the Mount is that Christianity goes beyond our acts to include our attitudes. With God, it's not just what we do, but why we do what we do. Now, first of all, as we begin with the 17th verse of Matthew 5 this morning, I think we ought to mention the fact that God's law was really incomplete until Jesus came. He begins by talking about law. God's law was incomplete until Jesus came for at least two reasons. Number one, no one had ever seen a life that was a result of complete obedience to the law. They had never seen the law lived perfectly before. And so the law in that sense was always incomplete until Jesus came. And secondly, because when Jesus came, he taught that law-breaking was more than an act, it was an attitude. Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, Jesus said. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you that till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Notice these two basic words in those two verses. 
First of all, the word destroy. I did not come to destroy. Now, destroy in the original language means to tear down. It was the word that they used when they tore down a building or when they took down a tent. That was the first word, taken down, gone. Jesus said, I did not come to do that to the Ten Commandments or the law. I came rather, he said, to fulfill. Now, perhaps a more understandable interpretation of the word fulfill is to complete. Many versions, perhaps your version of the Bible, uses the term complete in that passage. Jesus came to complete the law. In completing it, he added more to it than was there before. He made it more beautiful than it was before. And he made the law more useful, more practical than it had ever been. Jesus came to complete the law. Now, you don't go any further than the very next verse without understanding that God is very particular about our obedience to law. Right acts are required. Verse 19, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, in this context, this doesn't mean that that person is going to be up there in heaven. And while he's up there in heaven, he'll be called the least of those that are in heaven. But rather, as heaven looks down upon that individual who breaks and teaches others to break the law, heaven ranks that individual as the least of men. That is, called least by the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Continuing with verse 19, But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That little tiny word, do, a lot of people leave out of their Christian experience. Those that are called great in the kingdom of heaven are those that do the law and those that teach the law. You see, you determine what a man really wants by what a man does and not by what he says. If you work harder at your job than at your obedience to Christ, it's because you value your work higher than you value your relationship to God. Whatever it is that we're willing to work hardest at, to put our most time and effort in, is the thing that we value most. Now, the righteousness of Christ gives us a perfect status immediately in heaven. But Christ says that heaven is interested not only in our status, but also in our stature. Heaven is interested in our growth. And so heaven ranks us depending upon what we do. And I wouldn't dare say that if it weren't a direct quotation. Those were Jesus' words. So right acts are important, but right acts are insufficient. Christ was not a legalist. Verse 20, Matthew 5 and verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now that was a tough order. You must be more righteous, you amateurs, than the professionals. You must be more righteous, said Jesus, than the scribes. A scribe was a student of the law. He was a theologian in our modern interpretation. You've got to be more righteous than the theologians. And you've got to be more righteous than the Pharisees. Actually, the word Pharisee means a separatist. The Pharisee was so anxious to keep himself clean 
that he separated himself as completely as possible from the world. In fact, the whole Pharisee sect was a result of the tendency among the Jewish people to compromise with the Greeks. The Pharisees set themselves over in opposition to apart from the Hellenistic Jews. They were part of the Hasidim group. The word Hasidim means saints. And I suppose to understand how particular these individuals were to obey the law, to commit right acts, was perhaps most interestingly interestingly described by Jesus himself in Matthew 23 when he talks about the way they paid tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Matthew 23, 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Do you understand the picture that Jesus is painting here? These were herbs out of the garden, most of which had very small leaves. And the Pharisee was so particular to commit right acts that when it came to paying tithe, he picked one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine leaves of mint and put a tenth one over there for the Lord. Can't you just picture the Pharisee as he takes the harvest from his garden and counts out every seed to be sure that 10% of the seeds from the garden were given in tithe? And Jesus said, you've got to be more righteous than that. Now, folks, I don't mean to belittle us, but I maintain there's nobody here that's trying harder to perform right acts than they did. There's nobody here working harder at his or her Christian experience than the Pharisees. So what Jesus was saying is that right acts are required, but right acts are insufficient. You've got to be more righteous than the people who are committing more right acts than anybody around, said Jesus. Christ completed the law by emphasizing both right acts and right attitudes. We're going to notice now, Jesus is going to illustrate for us what he's just stated to us. The rest of the chapter, six times he does it. Six times Jesus shows an act that is demanded by the law and sets up against it an attitude emphasized by Jesus' teachings. Notice, now follow along. And again, we're still in chapter 5. Follow along. The first time he does it, verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Verse 22. But I say unto you, the first, the old, an act, and the new, an attitude. Verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. And verse 28. But I say unto you, Verse 31, it has been said, verse 32, but I say. Verse 33, again, ye have heard. Verse 34, but I say. Verse 38, ye have heard that it hath been said. Verse 39, but I say unto you. Verse 43, ye have heard that it hath been said. Verse 44, but I say unto you. Contrasting the old, the act with the new, the attitude. And thus Jesus completed, he enlarged upon, he magnified the law by adding attitude to act. Both are necessary. Now are they both an integral part of your Christian experience?
a couple from Iowa was driving to Chicago. They wanted to miss the traffic, all the rush hour traffic in the early morning and late afternoon, Chicago traffic. They decided to avoid that, they would drive by night. They left home in the early evening. They drove until about midnight. And then they stopped to get gas, to stretch their legs, to get some food, some drinks. At about the halfway point of their drive towards Chicago. And then they went back onto the freeway, planning to be in Chicago right about daybreak before the rush hour traffic hit. Just before dawn, they paused, pulled off the road again into a service station to ask how far it was to Chicago. And as they pulled into the station, there was something about this particular station that looked awfully familiar. And lo and behold, it was the interchange just outside their hometown. When they had gotten back onto the freeway at midnight, they had inadvertently gone completely in the wrong direction. And they had traveled all night. And they had talked and I suppose sung to themselves, took turns driving everything they could to stay awake. They had worked very, very hard at it, but they didn't get at all where they wanted to go. There are some of us that are working awfully hard at our Christian experience, but we're not getting to where we want to go. It's because we're going the wrong way. And you can try ever so hard going the wrong way and never get there. You may produce so many right acts, but if you come to God's house today with wrong attitudes, and if those attitudes have not been a significant concern in your Christian experience, you can travel that road forever, and you'll never end up getting to where you want to be. Jesus taught that both right acts and right attitudes are a part of the Christian experience. Christianity includes both. Now we're going to look at just three of those six examples that we briefly introduced today. Contrasting the old act with the new attitude. First of all, Christ wants to help us overcome not only violent acts, but also angry attitudes. Verses 21 and 22, Matthew 5, 21 and 22. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Rekha shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. The act? Murder. The attitude? Anger. Actually, anger does kill. There are a lot of walking dead among us, brethren and sisters. Everybody needs acceptance. And when we are not accepted, it kills something within us. When a person lives life surrounded with disapproval, it makes something within us die. Teachers kill. When they red pencil all of the students' mistakes and never reward him for what he's done well. Bosses kill when they point out and ride day after day every mistake an employee makes and never congratulate him or her for what they do right. Husbands and wives kill when they point out to each other over and over again the things that they don't like and never talk about the things they do. 
Parents kill when they remind a child of his failures and never let him savor the sweet smell of success. And children kill when they answer parents' love with rejection. Jesus goes on to say that anger prevents forgiveness. This is a form of suicide, and that's real murder. Verses 23 and 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Now remember, we've got to put this in a Jewish setting, a Jewish perspective. The gift here is probably talking about a sacrificial gift. The sinner brings the sacrifice to accept the forgiveness of Christ. But meanwhile, he holds within his heart anger toward his brother. And the whole thing, says Jesus, is a farce. If you come to worship today expecting the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ and are unwilling to forgive those who have wronged you, leave your gift at the altar, make it right with your brother or your sister. Only the forgiving are forgiven. So not just the act of murder, the attitude of anger, said Jesus, that's law-breaking. That's living apart from Christ, which is not really living at all, because Christ is the source of life. Why do we get angry at people? Did you ever stop to think, really, we get angry at people, not so much because of the thing they do as much as it is because of what we think of them as they do it? The lady called the desk at a hotel, just madder than a wet hen. She said, you've got to stop this infernal racket. This guy in the next room has got a piano. And he has been banging, 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 banging on that thing all day long. My head is about to split. I'm seeing black spots before my eyes. I'm going to have to head for the hospital, and you will be responsible. Well, said the clerk, I wish I could help you. But there's really nothing I can do. He said, that's... Paderewski, the world-renowned pianist, next door. And he's getting ready for his concert tonight in the auditorium. I just don't dare interfere. Paderewski? Moments later, she was on the telephone calling all of her friends to come over, and they have filled her room. And a very appreciative audience listened next door as the great Paderewski played as he practiced for his concert. Now, isn't that something? Music was exactly the same. The attitude toward the one performing it had changed. Now, Christianity does not promise to make all the people around you nice to you, but Christianity does promise to give you a right attitude toward them so that the nasty things they do to you don't really bother you all that much. And when that rascal does something mean, if you can just remember that that person is someone that was worth the life of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, pretty hard to stay very angry for very long. And so Christ, don't you see, wants to change not only our actions, but also our attitudes. Second example, Christ wants to help us overcome not only immoral acts, but also lustful attitudes. Verses 27 and 28. 
We're still in Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Do you suppose it's possible that adulterous people don't think much more or much more often about lust than do moral people? Jesus' audience didn't like that. This was near Capernaum. Roman soldiers were stationed at Capernaum. Officers laughing it up on through the night with their female companions. They would go out in a boat in Galilee and in the midst of all their revelry, gliding along the shouting and the laughter, the loud music, the loud talk drifted ashore. And oh, how the Jews hated those immoral actions, those immoral pagan Romans. And Jesus told them the people out there committing all those immoral acts are not all that different from you folk in here that are thinking about immoral acts, that are thinking lustful thoughts. What is it that determines what a man sees as he walks down the street? A hummingbird flying over the countryside sees what? Flowers. Sweetness, beauty, looking for flowers. A vulture flying over the exact same countryside sees nothing but filth, weakness death. What you see as you go along through the countryside of life doesn't depend so much upon the countryside. It depends upon the kind of bird you are. Verses 29 and 30, and if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand defend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. People have taken that to terrible extremes. But one of the lessons I would like to suggest that Jesus is trying to point out is the treacherousness of sin. We live in a society today which is very permissive. And whatever happens in society tends to creep into the church. After all, the church is a part of society. And right now, sin is just not very sinful. After all, in the church, we preach the righteousness of Christ. After all, there's always repentance. There's always forgiveness. There's always grace. And so what if you sin and sin and sin and sin? All you have to do is say, Lord, please forgive, and it's all erased, and then you just start in sinning again. But I think we misunderstand the treacherousness of sin. The fox caught in a trap in order to gain its freedom will literally gnaw his paw right off. Do you remember the story that happened 20 years ago in 2003? A man by the name of Aaron Ralston was hiking alone in a remote Utah canyon when his right hand was crushed against the canyon wall by an 800-pound boulder, fell in and just trapped him. He was unable to move, unable to free himself. After five days... 127 hours, he amputated his own forearm with a dull pocket knife in order to gain his freedom. That was his only chance for survival. And even after that, he had to repel with one arm 65 feet down a cliff and walk several miles to finally reach help. That's what Jesus is talking about. 
how terrible it would be to lose a limb. That, says Jesus, is how terrible sin is. And if someone should come into our congregation today, having just lost an eye or a hand, we would all gather around in sympathy and concern. Jesus says that sin is just as serious. You would be far better off to lose a hand, to lose an eye, than to live in sin. Brethren and sisters, if you look at it the way Jesus looks at it, sin is no trifling matter. And then the third example, Christ warns, well, wants to help us keep our word, not because of external pressure, but because of our internal conscience. Verses 33 through 37. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil." Now, this is another one that sometimes we have a bit of difficulty understanding. It meant a lot more to that society back there in Jesus' day than it does now, because the Jews of Jesus' day had a lot of ways to show whether or not they were going to keep their word, depending upon the oath they used when they gave their word. And in some ways, we kind of do that. We kind of parse our language. We might say, well, I think I'll, I'll think about doing that, or I intend to do that, or maybe I will do that, or maybe I promise to do that, maybe I vow to do that. Different degrees of commitment that we use. So back in Jesus' day, if you wanted to check whether or not a man was really going to do what he said he was going to do, you wanted to check the oath that he took as he promised to do it. Some oaths you could get out of pretty easy. Some oaths it was pretty hard to get out of. Jesus says no. The Christian keeps his word not because of something external, but because of something that is internal not because of something that society forced upon him, but because of his conscience that is within him. Or to put it in modern terms, his word is as good as his bond. He keeps his promises. You know, I think we all mean to be honest people. But did you ever stop to think that the keeping of our promises is a significant part of our Christianity? How glibly, how easily we say, oh, I'll take care of that. Okay, sure, I'll do it. And nobody ever hears from us again. That's what Jesus is talking about. Are you as good as your word? Or does somebody have to force you to keep your promise? Many years ago now, my family was returning from vacation. We were driving from Arizona where we were visiting my folks in Sierra Vista, driving back to Keene, Texas, where we lived at the time. And in the middle of West Texas, kind of halfway back home, our transmission decided that was it. It wasn't going to take us any further. And there we were in the middle of nowhere, stranded. We finally managed to get a hold of someone to tow the car into the next town. It was either Midland or Odessa, one of those oil towns in West Texas. But now what? We were strangers in a town hundreds of miles from home, had no money left. Our vacation was over. The money was all spent. We needed to be back to work in a couple of days. And looking through the yellow pages, there was only one transmission shop that we recognized the name of. You would probably recognize it as well. 
And so when in doubt, well, we'll, we'll go with this one. That's a, a well-known company. And so we called that company. The manager was very friendly. He said, I'll get someone on it tomorrow. Give us a day, maybe two days. It'll be as good as new. It sounded too good to be true. It was. How much will it cost? I wanted to know. Won't know until we get into it, but we'll call. Let's know, let us know as soon as you can so I can kind of plan what's going to go on here. And I gave him the phone number to the motel across the street. I knew we would be easy to reach. We weren't going anywhere. We didn't have a vehicle. It was hot. There wasn't much to do. No money to do it with. But you know, they never called. Never once did they call. I kept running over there to check the progress. I kept calling. After three or four days, the shop was still waiting on parts from Detroit and some others, I believe, from California. But at least they were able to give us a ballpark figure, maybe three or four hundred dollars. This was 40 years ago. But the motel was getting expensive. And finally, we just had to leave the car. I had to get back home, back to work. We had to get everyone back to our, to our home. And so my brother, who lived in Keene, and sister-in-law drove the hundreds of miles to pick us up and take us back home. And when these folk had finally gotten done fixing the car, a week later, the bill had totaled over $1,100. A brand new transmission would have cost $700. And guess why I traded that car in about six months later? You guessed it, transmission problems. Now, I don't know as I'd ever do any business there again. Would you? How much a difference it makes in the business world if we can be trusted to keep a promise. If every Christian businessman and businesswoman was there when they promised to be and do what they promised to do, if every Christian was known for the fact that they always kept their promise, you know what would happen? General Motors, Apple, Walmart, they would all send their people to church to learn how it's done. That's what would happen. And you know, I believe the gospel would be finished in no time at all. So Jesus says that Christianity goes beyond just our acts to our inward acts and thoughts. Please forget the good things that you have done today. Would you take a careful look at your attitudes? Maybe unintentional dishonesty, maybe lustful thoughts. How about anger? Anybody holding any bitterness in his heart today toward any fellow man? The Lord Jesus Christ wants to change your attitude. Oh, what a beautiful difference it makes when our attitudes are right. Final illustration. The young bride didn't want to be separated from her new husband. He was in the military and they sent him out to the California desert. She insisted on going along. He didn't think it was a good idea, but she didn't want to be apart from her husband. They couldn't find a place to live, and finally they just found an old shack out on the edge of the desert, way out in the very middle of nowhere. She hated it. And then he went on two weeks maneuvers. It became absolutely unbearable. It was 115 degrees inside the house. And the wind and the sand and the dirt were blowing, blowing, blowing. There wasn't a green thing in sight. The only place they were close to was an Indian village. And she didn't have a single friend there. She wrote to her mother. She said, it's too much. I'm coming home. Her mother wrote back, and she included these two lines. Two men looked out from prison bars. One saw mud, and one saw stars. 
and she grasped it instantly. The real problem was not where she was, it was her attitude toward where she was. And so she decided to look for stars. She walked into the Indian village and she tried to make friends. And at first they were distant. They were quite cool. They didn't really trust her. But when they saw that she was really reaching out, that she needed them, they accepted her and they made friends with her. And they taught her how to make pottery and how to weave. And she became very much enthralled with their culture and with their history and all about their lives. And then she looked out into the desert. There wasn't anything there but cactus. And she wrote back to her mother for a book on cactus. And she learned all about cactus. She finally came to the place where she could walk through the desert and find beauty every place she went. She became such an authority that she wrote a book on it. What had changed? Her situation? No. Her attitude. I don't know what kind of a mess life may be handing you today, but it's not so much your situation. It's your attitude toward that situation. And how do you change your situation, your attitude? You don't. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 82. Real conversion is a decided change of feelings and motives. Did you know that? Did you know that real conversion is a change of motives, a change of attitudes? Are you really converted? Am I really converted? That's what we need today, real conversion. Will you open your will right now to the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you accept his love in your heart? Will you let his perfect attitudes become your attitudes? Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Number 319.